So our, our objectives today is to get everybody in this room, uh, our primary objective is to get everybody in this room to pass three specific tests. The first test I want everybody to pass is to, when you think of Hadoop, when you think of what you need to do uh, in Hadoop, and, and, and if you get a, a Hadoop job, I want you to be totally relaxed. Yeah, 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 I get that. Oh, that's totally easy, no big deal. So that's the first objective. The, sec <laughs> the second objective that I would have uh, would be that when somebody tells you, oh, just go do it and don't bother automating it, don't, don't bother writing any code to, to actually set up a process for automating your Hadoop process, I hope that, that your reaction would be one of intense fear. And, and, and I'd like to take a lot of this demonstration just to show you why that would be the case, so that you would really actually wish to automate that process rather than just start slinging code madly. And the third, uh, the third test I would like to pass is that if, when everybody leaves here, they can jack up their rates five bucks an hour and then we all win. So. Yeah. Now, now Hadoop is, is, a big, is a big buzzword now. Uh, and so just to cover the essentials, I, I, I'm gonna cover a lot of stuff really, really, really <coughs> fast in this presentation. I'm gonna try to enumerate it so you can pick it up real quick. But, but we're, we'll, I'm not going to take questions until the end of the project and all of the slides, all of the code, all of the resources, even a YouTube demo of the, de of the, of the, of the demo portion, it's all going to be available at the end so you don't have to take notes if you want, you can just let it wash over you. I'm also going to do a, a demo at the end, I mean a, a, a demo twice of where the stuff is so if you don't catch it the first time we'll, go, we'll catch it a little bit on the second time. Uh, so. My, my bio here is uh, I've been a dev for 20 years, officially full-time dev for 20 years. Uh, the last 15 of it has been, has been Java. I did grow up automating in a different industry, in, in a physical uh, production line. And, and what, what happened is that kind of gave me an almost involuntary obsession with systems and automation. It, 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 another way of expressing that is I usually tend to automate first and then try to come up with some, with some excuse of why I automated later. So that's kind of why you, you, you see that I've, I've done some of the things that are per, per, perhaps a little overly automated. Since 2000, I've been data fundamentals, and we are now a two-man shop. So the first task was what? The first task was to get you guys up to speed and really, really relaxed with Hadoop. We're going to show you how to do that in, in, in a manual sense. And, and we're going we're gonna to define the term special snowflakes. Uh, and, and in other words, if you have a specific data set, that's a special snowflake. And, and, and you would say to your boss, oh, this is a special data set. I need to do this in a special way. And, and uh, by doing all this stuff and learning how to do it, of course, we figured out how to jack up our rates five bucks. And now that I've told you all that stuff, I'm going to tell you that, that in the DevOps world, which is a world that I've been sampling in for the last uh, half a year or so, special snowflake is a pejorative word. Special snowflake is a word that you use for uh, situations where someone really needs to automate it but instead they insist on doing it manually because they're, they're, they're too lazy to, well, that's, that's a judgmental word, they're not abstracting the piece of it that needs to be, that could be easily abstracted. So that's hopefully what I'll show you today. Uh, to go over this, I'd like to uh, reference my, my year of horror, which was 2013. Uh, 2013, we had 15 ETL jobs. How many people know what ETL is? Extract, transform, and load. That's just a fancy term for get a bunch of data and stuff it into Hadoop, or get a bunch of data and stuff it into wherever you're, you're doing that. It's a real important term now because we're all in this big data world, and we're finding that what we're used to, what we're accustomed to, is we're accustomed to having data on, on SQL uh, databases. Now we're actually having to stuff that data on all kinds of disparate data sets, and, and everything is, is, is a materialized view of this and a materialized view of that. And, and, and we, don't, we don't use SQL databases uh, for a lot of what we're doing now. So in that world, we're doing a lot of this uh, extract, transform, and load stuff. And that's one of the first things you need to do in Hadoop. You've got to get all your other data, put it in Hadoop. Hadoop is a file-based system, so everybody put that as one thing in their memory they learned tonight. It's a file-based system. It's not like, it's not like a SQL. And, and 
So what we did in 2013 is, is I interviewed uh, uh, most of the guys on the team and we hired a, a bunch of really, really, really top notch, uh, brilliant ninja level guys. I mean, these were developers that you would just wish you could work with on an, on an everyday basis. And then we said, okay, everybody go do your best. And, and these are all my friends, we did, everybody did their best. But what we did is we wrote all the code to do the work either by hand or even or either worse, we, we copy pasted a bunch of stuff. And at the end of the year, we did get the 15 ETL jobs done, but it was a bunch of, of spaghetti code. Every single person did it in a different way. It was, I think most people would judge it as, as, as relatively unmaintainable. And I had to ask myself, is this my benchmark? Is this the best I could do? And the answer was, gosh, I think I can do better. Okay, so now, that's, that's, that's my introduction on, on, on where we're trying to go into this. But now we have to start looking at Hadoop and what Hadoop is. So to do an ETL job, the first thing we have to do is get our data and, and we have to serialize our data into something that, that Hadoop likes. Now, having said that, Hadoop likes any kind of data you give it as long as you tell it how to handle that serialization format. You could make up your own uh, format. Uh, um, for example, XML and JSON. Everybody, everybody knows XML and JSON, right? But, but, but you could come up with your own serialization format, and as long as you wrote all the necessary code for Hadoop to handle it, you could give it to Hadoop, to, and, and it would be able to do that. But everything that you put in this, this system needs to be serialized, and the most important parts of this slide, and this slide could easily be a three-hour slide or even a six-week deep dive if you wanted to, the important things you need to know is you're probably going to have to pick a serialization format and you're probably going to want to know about thrift protocol buffers and Avro. Thrift protocol buffers and Avro are binary protocols. Uh, just, just know that they exist. Know that Facebook and Evernote and lots and lots and lots of other uh, heavy duty corporations <coughs> utilize thrift. Uh, you need to probably know that most uh, that most of what is inside Google is probably all protocol buffers. And you might wish to know that the Hadoop author created after those two, <coughs> and using those two, he created this thing called Avro, which is also a binary protocol. And that's Doug Cutting, the inventor of Hadoop. So whichever serialization protocol you use, you have to serialize your data. So I'm, I'm telling you that now. So now you have in your mind, hey, when I put stuff into Hadoop, I got to serialize it into some kind of a serialization format. In this particular case, we're using Avro. I uh, made a, one little project for, for taking, creating Avro from, <coughs> delimit, from delimited files, which uh, is available at the end of the talk. But now having said all this, everybody please understand this is the last time to say about, about the serialized uh, protocols and just understand that you have to do that as part of Hadoop. So now let's look and see what what it really means to be a, to get data into Hadoop and what it looks like when it's there. Let's let's say that this was the file that we need to do ETL on. Now, a typical a, a typical file in, in in Hadoop might might instead be uh, half a gig in size. It might be 400 rows wide. Lots of ours were, and and it might have obviously a large number of rows. Here you have just five columns and six and six rows. Uh, you can see ID name, tag, code, size. Inside Hadoop, the same table after we import it. And this is a SQL view of Hadoop. This is a hive view of Hadoop. It, in, in, we're going to co the, cover the file itself in a second. And my data is not there. Oh, there it is. Okay, um, thank you. Um, this is what it looks like inside Hadoop using the SQL interface. And, and, and this is a Hive. Hive is an external tool that allows you to query data that's inside Hadoop as if it's SQL. So let's, let's do this as SQL. Tag, code, and size. Querying Hadoop from Hive would look like this. Select tag, code, size.
It's going into MapReduce here. These are the MapReduce tasks being executed here. Uh, if the one thing that's very interesting about Hadoop is it handles massive data sets, but if you give it a small data set, it still takes like 10 minutes to, to, to do it. Um, but you can see I was able to execute a SQL, a SQL query against this data set, even though it's really not SQL data. So what else is involved here? Well, first of all, let's, let's look at the actual file itself. We saw that we can query it as, as SQL, but well, let's look at the file itself and see what it looks like. Where, what you do when you put uh, data inside Hadoop is you have to tell it physically where you're going to put it. You have to actually create the directories and, and you have to say, oh, I'm putting it in that directory. And then you have, to convert, you have to provide the file itself, which I provided here. And if we click on this actual data and to see what it looks like, because we are using the Avro format, this, this looks like JSON unless you look at it in the binary format. In the binary format, this is what it really looks like here, this, because it's a binary format. Or if you want to look at it in a compressed format, this is, this is what it really looks like. So, so you can see that, that, that this sample table uh, has a, a different, cons I mean, is actually there, but it's in, a, in the serialized format. So, if we now understand, if we look at this, we now understand, oh, hey, I can do this. This is easy. I've got my five books already. All I have to do is take the, the, the data, I take this, this file right here, I convert it into Avro, and then into an Avro format, and then I put it in the right place over on the Hadoop system, and bingo, I'm done. Well, actually, that's not too far from the truth. You're actually pretty close to being there. There are a couple other things you need to do. You need to tell Hive, Hey, uh, this is this is uh, uh, this is what we got coming in. That you have to it's like DDL in SQL. You have to give Hive the DDL. Uh, so you say, hey, here's where I'm going to put it in 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 this directory here. <clears throat> so this is where I'm going to put it here. Good, got that covered. And then this is where the schema for this, for this particular file is right here in, in this directory. Oh, okay, except we didn't talk about where the schema is. So we've talked about the, D, the, the DDL, but not the schema. Now let's look at the schema. So, so far we've only learned two things, right? The location of the data and the fact that you gotta serialize it. Okay, and, and three things, you gotta give it DDL. So to do the schema, This is the schema file here, and, and you'll notice this is a JSON file here. This is particular to an Avro format. The schema would be different if it was, if it was not Avro. But you can see here the same five columns, ID, name, tag, code, size, and it will accept either null or string for each of these. You know, like, like SQL DDL, you can tell it int or whatever, whatever else you need to tell it. So now we have so now we have an, uh, one more thing that we need to tell it. I think we're at five now. We need to give it a sequel. So we got five things is all we have to remember so far, and, and we can add that five bucks, do an ETL job, and we're, and we're done. Except for one more thing. We're almost there, Mark. We're almost there. So, so we, have, we have the data in here. We, we figured out how to tell it where the data is going to be, and we figured out how to get the schema file written because we wrote some quick little thing to do a, a schema file. But I kind of lied when I said that this is where, remember I said this is where the data is going to be, and that's what I put in the DDL statement? But, but that's really not the whole truth because we got this ETL date here, which is partitioned by. And we don't even really know what that means yet. So sure enough, I've got one more folder deep. And this other folder is where the actual file is. And this other folder says ETL date equals, in this particular case, 2014-620. OK, so now that's six things that we got to know. We gotta get, we've got to get the, the partition set for the data. This is not real hard, right? I mean, everybody agree that five bucks was easy so far? We, we got, we, all we have to do is figure out those six things. I've got to write 
this particular folder, give it all the proper permissions, put my, my Avro file in that folder, and, and, I, and I now have an ETL job. Yes, that's almost correct. That's all you have to do. You just have one more. No? We're almost there, guys. We're almost there. We're almost there. We got one more step we got to do to get this data in there. And we got to run this alter table and say, ah, oh, dude, we got this data coming in and it's going in that partition. And then we have to tell it where the partition is also. So that's just a command that we run. And, and, and if we were running this in Hive, for example, we would take that command and we would, and, and you could actually do this, by the way. It's not, it's not confusing. You, you could actually, and then just paste it in here and then execute this as SQL. So, so I would execute that as SQL. I would execute, execute this other DDL as SQL. Again, we're familiar with this because we work with SQL databases. It's all the same stuff as SQL <coughs> databases. You're, you're telling it to what to do DDL-wise. And, and now, with this last step here, and of course here, this, this would not be a variable. This would be a literal here. I'd have to put in a real date. But with this last step, we can now say we're done. The presentation is over. We got our five bucks. Let's go home. Okay, good. As you might guess, this particular process of getting data, oh, please be the right one, yeah. This particular process of getting data into the, the system is pretty error prone. You, <laughs> Okay, let me give you some example. Uh, I, I might have a, a, an, a, an Adobe Omniture file, which is a, a cookies file with, with a half a gig in size, 400 columns wide, and, or it might be 200 columns wide today, and then they send me a new file, then they send me a new file the next day, and oh yeah, by the way, the scheme is different, and some columns have been rearranged, and, uh, we, have, and we have an extra partition that, that we need uh, that the business analyst needs for his query and also we got another 200 columns that we added to the ones that we switched order in. If you're talking about that level of stuff all in files like these and and you're having to specify all this this sorry all this information all the metadata about where everything goes manually it's a it's it's a big copy paste job. It's real prone to error, and not only that, but it has a, a bunch of hops to get there. Uh, you you actually have to get all the files in place and then test it, and then you find out what isn't working. And if two things are not working, God bless you. So the the, the problem is that to find out what's not working, all it does is it just doesn't work. And then you have to go through the log files and you have to see what kind of error statements there are in the log files and, and they're not always clear. You know, may, I'll give you an example of what threw us a lot of the time. Lots of times we didn't do the, the change mode on the, on, the, on the file. And so we, we would get the file in, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the change mode on the file and we would get the file in there, but the system couldn't read it because it was the wrong permission setting. And so we would go through the log files and, and work for half a day to read some obtuse meth, meth message and find out, oh yeah, it's permissions on that file. So this is the problem with the system. It tends to be somewhat brittle and challenging to work with. If, if you guys are falling asleep now and if you're thinking, man, this has got to be crazy, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. It's a little bit crazy. It, it, it's a real cumbersome process and that's why on this slide here, that's why we had a crack team and we ended up with freaking 15 ETL jobs done after a year. Give me a freaking break, guys. This is not that big a job. So how, how, first of all, let's ask the question, if it's that brittle and if it's that, when I say hard to do, it's actually easy to do. We saw there's only seven steps and any of us could do any of those seven steps, but it's easy to do wrong. 10 bucks. It's what? 10 bucks. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if it's worth the $5 increase. <laughs> okay, so, so, so stay with me, guys. Okay, stay with me. Uh, we're we're going to get there. First, we have to figure out if it's even worth it. And to figure out if it's even worth it, we have to ask, we have to ask the question, what, what is it that makes Hadoop so cool? 
And the, the, the thing that makes Hadoop so cool is this. You can take that half a gig file and use it as input. And you can add that to another three years worth of files that you got every single day that were also half a gig. And you can keep stuffing that stuff in this, in this system and it just keeps handling it. It can handle unbelievable amounts of data. And the, the reason it can handle unbelievable amounts of data is because it takes those, that data and spreads it over as many machines as you need to spread it. 10 machines, 20 machines. Uh, you could have, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are Hadoop clusters with, with 1,000 machines out there. So that's pretty cool. Now, let me, let me throw this at you here. Not only is it pretty cool, look at this. This particular uh, row might go in machine number 23. This one might go in, in machine 42. This, machine, this row here might go in, in, in machine 17. This might go in machine one, data node one, and this one might go in six. All these might go in a completely different place. And yet to us, when we're looking at it in the file system, it looks like it's just a single, a single location in the file system. It, it has some pretty cool aspects. And then we can run this same kind of query that we ran, that we ran here to get, to get the, the table, the, the data. We can run any kind of query against that whole system and come up with something logical, which gets us to the second cool thing about Hadoop. The reason that works is because in Hadoop, you don't get all that data. We've got, we've got a lot of data out there for all those billions of rows that we've collected over the last three years from the half gig files. We got all that data, we got all that data, and we don't bring that data in to some server. Uh, some master server and then and then run a, a program against it. Obviously, that would be crazy. That would never work. We actually have to move the program to the data. Okay, guys, I just told you the two cool things about it. If you don't walk out of here with anything else besides those two things, you've got 90% of Hadoop right there. You place the data across lots of machines and then you move the program to the data and not the data to the program. I really could end this talk now. You really could go home. You don't get your five bucks, but, you're, but you got, <laughs> no, but you got, but you got most of what you need to understand Hadoop. And when somebody starts mouthing off Hadoop, you're going, yeah, I get that because this is all that there is. Well, actually there's one more thing and then you have So, so the one more thing is this. How do you take, how do you bring the program to the data instead of the data to the, pro, <clears throat> instead of bringing the data to the program? And the answer is MapReduce. Hadoop uses this API called MapReduce. Some people think it should be called Map Shuffle Reduce. And what it is, you stick, you, you write your program in two passes. The first pass you give to the map, the second pass you give to the reduce. The, 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 the map portion will go to every single node, every single data node, and like say you want to combine column one and six, six for example, it'll go to every single data node, combine one and six, bring some aggregate result, and then that result is shuffled, handed back to the program, shuffled, and then it's, and then it's re aggregated to, into, in, into a useful result in the reduce step. So which pieces is in the map, which, pieces, which part of the program is in the map, which part of the program is in the reduce? Well, actually, that's up for you to decide that because you're the one who has to write the map reduce or, or in the case of, of, of if you're just going to use Hive, you don't even have to do that, and it will write the map reduce from, from your SQL statement. But the important point is <clears throat> that the API for running, the, taking the program to the data is called MapReduce. And that's the, those three things. If you just walk out of here knowing those three things, you will understand the big lion's share of Hadoop. The only other thing that, that you kind of want to know about Hadoop at the fundamental level is you want to know, oh yeah, Hadoop is really an ecosystem, man. And what that means is 
Yes, there is Hadoop. Yes, there is Hive, which is what I showed you. But there are probably a couple dozen other major pieces that you can bolt onto Hadoop and use. Not only that, a lot of the pieces that are a part of Hadoop, such as Zookeeper, MapReduce, Pig, and Hive, are also used outside of Hadoop by products such as uh, Couchbase, uh, Cassandra, other things like that. So when you get into big data, you're going you're gonna to be able to put your hands on your hip and you're going to say, oh yeah, I don't know if we should use Couchbase or Hadoop or, or Cassandra for this, or, or, or Mongo or some other. But I do know that we would still want to evaluate the, the, the results in, using MapReduce because I'd like to use MapReduce. Or, or I'd like to use Pig, which is an abstraction on top of MapReduce. So, so you get the idea that there's this giant ecosystem and that you may want to know more about it later. Okay, that's it. That's all on Hadoop. Um, now we're going to go on to the automation side and we're going to look at this, this pejorative thing, this special snowflake thing, and we're going to look at is, is there another approach? Because I think we all might agree that, that that's a pretty cumbersome process. At least it was in my experience. I can say that for sure. And I'm assuming since we had brilliant, brilliant guys on our team. I'm pretty sure that, that uh, it's going to be the same for you too if you do it all manually. So how do we unpack this? Uh, if we remove the human drama from, from this piece and, and we just try to extract what the essence of the pieces are, okay, the, the, the first obvious thing is we're just taking an input file and we're, and we're putting it into to Hadoop. Okay, we got that part. To do that, what do you need? You need a lot of money. We had a budget for our little pilot project. You need your project managers, your sysadmins, uh, probably business analysts to tell you which fields go where, and, and you need, of course, developers. Uh, you're going to have a lot of file handling. You guys saw how much file handling, moving files, doing transforms, such, so you're probably going to want a server that's separate <coughs> from your Hadoop cluster, because you're probably not going to want to do all that on your Hadoop cluster, that file handling. You just, just something like a, a standard Linux server for that. We already discussed, you're going to have to have a schema for your data, assuming that you use something like Avro that requires a schema, and you're going to have to run that schema with the DDL. Uh, so you got that piece. And obviously, if you have a, a server doing this processing, you're going to have to get the sysadmin to build the server. So everybody's following me so far, except really we need 3D, we need the prod server, we need the test test server, and wasn't it you were saying we really need, no, somebody was saying that you need to have, uh, uh, every, everybody needs to, yeah, you are saying everybody needs to have their own sandbox. Whoever said that, absolutely, you do not want to do any of your development on prod or test, ever, period. You have everyone do all the development of all the code on, on their workstation uh, using a, a VM uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for this server here and using a VM for this Hadoop cluster here. And, and so, anyway, you can see we need these pieces. Then we already went over the fact that we gotta convert it to the Avro file, uh, to a, some kind of format before it goes over. You gotta apply whatever partitions, run that DDL for the partitions, and then you gotta move it into the first, over, over to this Hadoop cluster, and then actually into HDFS. So there's two, mile, two moves inside here. And then additionally, there may be additional transforms such as we're going to put it in with these columns, but I want to create some more columns which are derivative of that. So there's our work sequence. We got seven discrete steps. Manual, automated, seven discrete steps. Everybody agrees? Everybody sees it? Good. Now, what happens if we try to automate it? Mark, is there any emotion that comes to mind if we try to automate it? Okay. It, is there any emotion that comes to just the concept of automating this process? Okay, well, my emotion was horror, so that's why I named this my part of this after, after the horror film Carrie. And, and, and what, what, what Carrie does is what we tried to do is we, we, we look at this drawing here, we say, okay, I got code here, I got code, code here, I got code here, code here, code here, code here. This is, these, I just got to write some code templates. That's what I got to do. I got to write code templates, and that's what carry is. It carries just a bunch of code templates where we bring in metadata and apply the code templates. But in addition to that, we also need something uh, besides my, my sysadmin who takes three weeks to give me a new server uh, to build the, the, the server to do, to do this, this drop here. 
the, the two pieces we use to do that server is we use Vagrant to build the VM and we use Chef to do the, the actual installation of everything on the server. Like I gotta get Java on the server, I gotta get Maven on the server, stuff like that. So, so that's, and, 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 I want, and, I want, and I want to use this stuff to build all of, all of the servers, prod, test, and, and all the dev servers too. The one thing that we don't try to do is, and I would suggest that you not do it unless you just have a whole lot of extra time on your hands, I mean a lot, a lot, is to build a Hadoop cluster. Uh, it, it's, it has defied many people. Just get that, get that VM from, from your uh, Cloudera or Hortonworks uh, distributable. Uh, they they off they furnish a, a, a Hadoop VM, and if you are going to install a serious Hadoop cluster at your job, don't worry about it. They will not even talk to you. They will hire Cloud, uh, Cloudera to do that, or they will hire Hortonworks to do that. So you don't need to worry about it. Okay. The last thing we need before we do this is we need some kind of a of a, of a, a coalescing discipline. How do we do this? And the way we do this. Um, how many, just curious, how many people have even heard of the Phoenix Project? Okay. If, if this were a DevOps group, uh, if this were a, if, say it again? Yeah, Agile Austin is a DevOps group and, 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 and they do, and they did cover this. If this, if this group were a bunch of sys admins, I would have had 40 or 50 percent uh, on, on the, that raising hands. And the reason is because this, is, this book is all the rage right now in the DevOps community. It is in the, for the sys admins of the world, the, the ops the side of, of, you know, we're on the dev side, but if, for, in the ops side, this, this book is the main thing. I'm going to give you, this, this is another three hour talk right here, or six week talk, either one. But the, I'm going to give you the, the, the three minute version. This book talks about results and not drama. The human drama doesn't matter. It only focuses on actual measurable results. And it only focuses on the bottleneck, which, in, uh, um, which almost always in this book ends up being this guy named Brent. <laughs> so, so who is Brent and why do we care? Well, it, first of all, we assume that since he's a bottleneck, he's some kind of a bad guy, but, but here's my picture over here. And, and, and look, I'm telling you, I want to be Brent because Brent is, is usually the go-to guy on the team. Usually he's, he's the ninja, he's the badass, he's the one that, that is, is brilliant and, and, and everybody wants to be the Brent, the go-to guy. But Brent is a bottleneck when he insists on doing everything manually. If you, if you tell me to go do this Hadoop job, and I am creating all this stuff by typing in commands in a shell script, in a, sh in a, in a shell, and, and saying, okay, CD this, MKDIR this, change mode this, MV this to that. I I'm gonna be six weeks doing it, and then that's only the first time, because you're gonna change it 12 times, and then I'm gonna have to redo all that, those commands. So, so Brent is a problem when he insists on doing everything manually. He may enjoy the attention of being a problem, but he's not really the drama queen anyway. <coughs> so that's, that's all about Brent. How do we help Brent out? And again, when I say how do we help Brent out, who's the Brent in the room? I'm the Brent. You're probably the Brent too. But, but how, how do we help this out? Well, if I go back, if I go back to that, that, that 2013 bad year that I had, the first thing I would, the first conclusion I would come to is we need to stop Brent from doing fun stuff that he, that's just reinventing. Um, and, and Mark, you're going to want to uh, chime in on this, but don't. Um, but um, <laughs> but what we did, what we did, because we were so damn smart, and I told you, we hired ninjas. We have these, this is a team of ninjas, and we recreated Apache Camel, or at least the parts of Apache Camel that we needed. And not only that, we recreated it freaking twice. We, we blew our entire budget by recreating what we could have found in Apache Camel. It was all there. We just ignored it because we were so damn smart that we had to do that. And by the way, it didn't end up being that good. But what, what we created, we ended, up, we ended up first creating Java, which is at least testable and maintainable, and then we ended up recreating it in Bash scripts. You hadn't seen spaghetti code until you've seen this stuff. But, but the important thing is we need to make sure that Brent is enabled to use existing, he's encouraged to, 
to do proudly invented elsewhere instead of not in invented here. And we need to give him the tools to do that, which in this case is Apache server, I'm, I'm sorry, Camel server. Um, and, and we need to encourage him to take all the time that he saves by not reinventing and use that in cleaning up the design. Because we, if we really automate this stuff in, in terms of code templates, we want some really clean templates. The worst thing in the world, if, if you're going to automate something, is to create a bunch of bad stuff. If you're going to create a bunch of stuff, create good stuff. So we will let him clean up his design real well. The second we're going to do is, is apply the metadata to templates. I've got an example here. Let's, um, let's take that, that high, the DDL. Oh, boy. The, this, is, this is a scrunched up version of the DDL. Yeah. And you can see we've got table name here in one, two, three, four places, five places. We've got HiveDB in two places, three places. We've got, um, anyway, we want, what we want to do, um, HDFS dir in two places. What we want to do is we want to write these templates in a way that they can be stuffed with these values accurately the first time and it all works. And you want this all to be the cleanest possible code that you can do. And you're going to tell him, look, Brent, obviously not everything is going to fit in this common pattern. So the stuff that's an exception, hey, don't worry about making templates for it. But if it's the stuff that's common to all of these 15, and the 15 is in pilot project, you know, 300 coming up after that, then let's do that in, the temp in code templates and let's apply our metadata to those templates. And last but not least, the server thing that, that, that we got. Oh. The server thing we got here, <clears throat> we really don't want to be creating that manually because we know what's going to happen. We're going to recreate it 17 times anyway. First we're going to have it this way, then we're going to have it this other way. And every time we do that, we want to do it from code. We want to do it manually so that every single time it's all in sync. So with using these three rules, these, these are the basics that we can tell Brent how, tell Brent, tell myself, tell any of us how we can not be a Brent, not be a bottleneck, and actually get this thing done in a, in a, in a good way. So to, to start the, the review of the process, how are we doing on time? Got an hour. Okay, we're clean. Um, to, start, to start this, we'll start with the building of the server, and this is, what, this is the part that Jeff works on, so he'll do this part. All right. I'm Jeff. I'm the number two employee at Data Fundamentals, but I know I'm number one in your heart. <laughs> and I'm the uh, more operations-oriented guy for us and trying to get this stuff figured out. And so, as requirements were given to me by project management, which is to say, I have to uh, basically come up with a, or start off with a raw uh, CentOS VM, and then install Java, Maven, Ruby, do a little bit of network config, maybe add a couple of uh, Maven repos, and tools I used were to go with Vagrant and uh, I can do all the configuration with Chef. So let's see. I'll um, basically show you everything that's involved at this point in getting it set up. And I'm going to move kind of fast here, so be ready. And actually, just for proof of point, you can see a couple of uh, VMs already running and ignore the uh, CentOS one because I don't trust the demo gods. But uh, here is basically all that's involved. There. So, as you can see, we have a brand new VM starting and running, and we have a uh, we now have a couple of things getting configured and put onto it, and so. Just for fun, we'll play a little bit of a pop quiz. And um, just in general, can anybody actually answer and tell me what is Vagrant and what it actually does? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Vagrant's developed by HashiCorp. It allows you to spin up virtual machines using many different types of providers. Right. Uh, including EC2, VirtualBox. Uh, right. Yeah, and, that, and that's the important thing. It's just a front, uh, front end for spinning up virtual machines of any instance and type that you want. And obviously, we've stuck with VirtualBox based on what you've seen. And uh, we've done our configuration with Chef. And 
uh, obviously there are other tools, so I was going to ask, uh, can anybody name any of the other four major tools out there that are using uh, that do configuration management? And one of them is not Bash Scripts. Yeah, you got it. Bash is Bash and Puppet. Okay, gotcha. And got it. Yes, they're still around. But, uh, and what it does is it allows us to uh, basically have uh, dev, test, and prod uh, machines all configured basically identically using the same what? And I'll just answer this because it's going to be faster. Is use what recipes? Close code, which is basically <coughs> using the same code to configure everything. But yeah, that's actually the answer to the next one. Is uh, Chef boxes are just basically run lists of recipes, which is all the same code to set up and configure it. Meaning, if you have, I want to install Java on any any on. Uh, 1500 dev uh, or uh, 1500 prod servers and six dev servers is all the same code. It doesn't matter. And what's the really important feature is the item potency to me. And how would you define item potent with Chef? If anybody could answer. Exactly. This guy gets a gold star today. I, like <laughs> I can't it. hear what he's saying. Though. Okay. He uh, he's saying that basically you can do multiple runs of the same code and it only does the, the one action once. Meaning that if you have 15, if you do 15 or 20 runs or you have it set on a cron for your machine to make any updates, it won't create 15 of the same file if you have it specified in the run list or it won't add 14 new users every time you do a new run. It just sticks with what um, and does it once. And that's pretty powerful stuff. And uh, actually, I bet you we're done by now. Yep, everything's done. That server is up and running. Um, just as a fun bit of extra credit, I wanted to point out that Docker is using containers, which is analogous to VMs, but they're basically going to be the future. So if you want to know what's going to happen in the next couple of years, that's going to be really cool. Keep an eye on that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I'll, I guess I'll just pass. Go ahead. Docker is one of the other Right. Yeah, they uh, Docker had their official first conference and um, yeah. Yeah, their their process. Right. They they just basically contain the process independent of everything else, so you don't have any run conflicts or anything like that. Yeah. Pass back to people now. What? Oh, uh, kitchen. Uh, oh yeah. No, I just use uh, Test Kitchen because Test Kitchen is a uh, basically our general testing framework that we're using to help run our uh, unit integration tests, and so it's just as easy to uh, run a uh, spin up and a converge all in one. So that's just why we used it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but it's all being done on the it's all being done behind the new windows. Okay. Are you using like are you using uh, integration tests with test with kitchen itself, like using uh, server spec, etc. No, I use, I you can do I have a server spec running. I I don't like to use bats because I just like to focus everything on Ruby. But yeah, I use server spec uh, when I'm running kitchen tests, and then I'll uh, beforehand I'll just run R or I'll run chef spec as my uh, unit test beforehand. Okay, so now we should have our machine. Okay, let's do a couple tests. Dog mesh version. Good. <coughs> Okay, so we got a, we got a live machine. Thank you very much, Jeff. That took what two minutes to build, three minutes to build. The nice thing is this is exactly identical to what will be on prod and test. It's also exactly identical to be what's on your machine if you're on my same team. We're golden now. I don't have to worry about you know changing configuration files when I move from machine to machine. Uh, life is easy. So we got one of the. We got one of the, the problems solved. The second problem we got to get solved if we're going to automate this process, we got to actually collect the metadata. Again, I told you I wrote this cute little project. And I'm going to give you the code for my project, for the carry project. 
but I'm not, and you're welcome to do anything you want with it, but I'm encouraging you to think of this as, an, as, a, as a demo of what you would do rather than what I'm going to do. I just wanted to show everybody that it's possible and that it's real, real drop dead easy. So, the way, the way I wrote this, this little, this little uh, project, this little carry project, is, is first you've got to log in and, and it's going to collect some, some we're going we're gonna to make up a face name. Mark, what's your last name? Meandro. M-E-A-N-D-R-O. M-E? <laughs> Okay, say it again. Me, M E A N D R O. Is that right? Yep. Okay, we're going to pretend like Matt, uh, Mark wrote this. We, we need an IP address for the, for, for the server that Jeff built. So let's confirm that. Yes, this is the. Yes, uh, uh, again, uh, this is the metadata that will fill in things like HDFS, DUR, and. Uh, table name and things like that, HiveDB, stuff like that. That's what we're that's what we're doing right now. And look, you're going to look at this and then you're going to go, dude, that was really cute, but you could have done that with a properties file and you'd be right. So, um, oh yeah, I needed I needed the uh, IP address for the server Jeff built. Okay, good. It did build with the address that I had hoped. So it's 3344, home vagrant is the home. We just checked that. We do need to tell it for sure that this is building from my box. Okay. So now it says, I'm gonna add a data source. And you guys are gonna have to help me here. We, we don't have unlimited time, so make, the, make it real fast, dumb answers. We need a neat, unique name for this particular thing. So somebody give me a unique name. Waldo. Waldo. And uh, we need a class name for this guy here. U-T. <laughs> U-T. Uh, I'm going to make it harder. Unum text. And package name. Awesome job. Mm -hmm. Org. Dot. Uh, Austin. Austin Jug? Yeah. Okay, there you go. The drop folder, this is good enough, work, ETL, drop. Uh, again, what, what is the drop folder? That's the place that we're going to take the file, we're going <coughs> to drop it into that folder, and it's going to process it, the, uh, the data. We only know how to do Hadoop with this system. We do need a, a partition uh, scheme, so we're going to just use current date instead of. We could, we could use it to take the date out of the, the file name, but well, I'm not set up to do that, so we're not going to. Um, and we're going to have this take the, the column head, we're going to build the schema file from the column headers. So there, there's other ways we could do this, but in this case we're just going to do it this way. So we are now ready to submit. Oh wait, it's Hadoop. It recognizes that I need more things. I need, what, what, what table do we need for the table name? Vivo. Vivo. And uh, with your guys permission I'll take this default, it's fine for the HTTP. FTP dir and HDFS dir. We have to have a default as a, as a DB because that's what the Cloudera VM uses. And we need Cloudera and Cloudera for the username password. And we, use, we know we need this because this is what the Cloudera VM does, but we don't need that. I need to know what that is. So looking at the Cloudera VM, it says 56101 is the uh, 160, 2.168.56.101. Come on, people. 56.101 is what we're going to use for our SSH address. SSH port is 22. Submit. Okay, here's our little properties file looking deal. And you can see this has got all the features that we need to populate our little code templates. Will this really work? Import from existing projects, browse. We, we're in the ETL projects, which is where we told it to write it to. There's Waldo. Let's try it out. Okay, we recognized it as a project, which means we had that file in there properly. So now we have, now we have a demo project named Waldo. If we build this using Maven, 
It's running the tests, so it's got a test in there somewhere. Uh, no failures, so that's working. Uh, anybody use the Shade plugin? The shade plugin. Everybody knows we're talking about the Shade plugin. If you're building, if you're building a jar and you want that jar to be executable, you can use this thing called the Shade plugin for Maven. It's really cool, and it'll take and, and put all the dependencies inside. It'll build your jar just like Maven will, but then it'll take all your dependencies and the jar itself, and then wrap it in a, in a shade jar, and then it becomes executable. It's pretty cool. What ID are you using? Uh, Eclipse. Is there another one? On Mac, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so it looks like we got a clean build, and looks like it worked. Um, let's take a look at some of these major, uh, major features. Obviously, the, the the one thing that we need is we need that that DDL because we we already looked at the DDL and we know we're going to need that that file. So, here's a DDL file that worked. That's good. We're gonna need that alter table statement and all the related stuff that goes with that. So there's that, that's good. So that's the, that's the, the two things that we, we know we're gonna need. But we talked about we're using a Apache Camel and we talked about we've got this, remember we, we talked about we got those six <coughs> things that we need to do and here we talked about the six, one, two, four, five, six, the six things that we need to do with our code. So here, here's our Camel file. This sets the directory SSA, da, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six things that we need to do. Actually, these may not correspond exactly to the numbers one through six, but basically you can see that we're, we're using camel to just tell, we're using camel to tell uh, what files to move where, what transforms to do. Here's the one that does the actual transform from a CSV file. So it looks like this stuff may work. Um, we've also got some just little helper scripts, like when, when we SCP this over to the, to the uh, server that Jeff built, this, this is the little SCP script that helps us out. We wouldn't have to do this, we could just <coughs> type this in. But everything, I have found everything you have to type in is another chance for error. So if you can write it into a stupid script, and put it in a, a placeholder, especially if you're already collecting the metadata. What the heck, make it easier. So, let's see what happens if we go onto my box, ls, there's Waldo, and let's try to run that deploy to server thing. Source, Waldo, then, It's asking me for Jeff's password. So I did move those files over. Got one more. Okay. So supposedly we moved the, the stuff over there. Let's look in Jeff's thing and see if they're there. Okay, I got a Waldo file there and I got a setup.sh script, which will supposedly, if we, if we run that setup.sh script, it'll place everything where it needs to go. It's got a bunch of uh, make durs and change owns and MVs. In it. So you know, source, setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, this, this is uh, again running, running the Maven build first because it needs the binary. Then it runs the shade jar, builds it into a shade jar runs the test, and then if this works, what it, the last thing it does is it runs this main.sh. And main CDs into the, to the Waldo directory, sorry, and then runs, runs the, uh, the jar. A Little bit about this jar, guys. Not only will this jar run just like I'm running it here as, as its own uh, executable, but it, it is also an OSGI jar, which gives us what advantage? Mark, what advantage does this give us <coughs> if I've got an OSGI camel jar here? Uh, no and your I can I can put this in a camel container. I can put this in a fuse container. Yes. And and and, and, and uh, Mark works every day with the camel, and he works every day with fuse. I, I assume you still do. 
And so this can go in a fused container. Yes, I can run it independently as an independent jar, but it also goes into a camel container and is run as a part of fabric or fuse or whatever the, the container du jour is. So anyway, that's yeah, pretty good. You can put it in a fuse fabric that require features. Oh, it would, okay. So, yeah, so a camel jar then. Thank you. Uh, so that's, that's what should be happening. Now, if that did work, you, what you would see here, come on, oops, wrong one. Come on. <clears throat> oh, great. I just, I just screwed the pooch here. One moment, please. I just did a control C, which killed this guy here. Vagrant work, ETL projects. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So now I started up the jar again since I decided to kill it a second ago. Now what it's doing, it's it's polling this ETL folder, uh, this ETL drop folder every minute or so. In a second we ought to see the next one. And so if we just create some data, drop it over into there, we'll know whether or not this pro project is bogus or not. I need your help one more time, please. I would like to create a data file for Waldo to test with. So we're gonna take the previous file Moving into our project. Okay, <clears throat> I need some help here. I need to start changing some stuff. I'll I'll start here, Waldo. I need I need some other names. Mark, I've been picking on you all night. My favorite. Um, Rob, I'll I'll pick you here. I need a column. I need another column here. Age. Age. I'll do, I'll do my age first. 96. 7. No, actually, I'm not looking to. I'm not looking to. Sorry, what I meant was. Sorry, this is what I meant. This is what I meant. Sorry. Uh, um, Sue is going to be 16, and Bill is going to be 25, and just for grins, Harry is going to be 101. Um, let's change tag to what? Wait, suitcase. <laughs> Wait. Okay, so now we have everything we need to know that this for sure is our deal. <coughs> so if we've done this, let's go back to our thing and you can see, you see how many times this pulled while we were creating this file? It's looking for that file. It wants that file bad. Let's see if we, let's see if it works. So I go to I go to my guy here and I've got a script for deploying that too. So I go said, oh, thank you. At least somebody's watching out for me. Source in no, no, no. Source Waldo in dev two. Okay, now I need Waldo source test resources Waldo. Okay, so this will supposedly dump that file that we just put in the direct in the drop folder and it's going to take care of everything. How many people believe that it really will? Okay. Sorry. Vagrant. <clears throat> okay. At least it, that part worked. Ah, look. The first thing it did is it copied the file. 
the Waldo file. So we can see that it copied the Waldo file. And then we can see that it ran the transform, so that part happened. And then we can see after that, that it moved the file over. And then, and then once it moved, then it moved the file a second time. Oops. And, uh, and then it, it apparently looks like it's finished because it started looking for the, for the next file again when it finished that. So theoretically, we have a completed demo and this, this file will be there. So if I look in Hue, there's the Bevo table. So, so far so good. If I browse the data, there it is. Waldo, Mark, Rob, 96, age. Didn't have to go look at log files and figure out what the error was. Uh, where um, did the Hadoop cluster? These are hard to build. We didn't build this Hadoop cluster. This, 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 okay. I told you we would go too fast, so we did. We went too fast. Um, we have a Hadoop cluster right here. This is a this is a VM that we got from Cloudera. Okay, this is the important thing. We got it from Cloudera. You could build this VM yourself. You could use Chef and build it. If you do, would you send me the recipe, please? Because we can't freaking out how to do it. But and by the way, nobody else can either. Um, but, but it, these things are real hairy to configure for some reason. Hadoop is, is real screwball-y to configure. And, and um, so we just get it from Cloudera, and, and, and we just SSH, SSH into the one that we get from Cloudera, which is um, this window here. I'm, I'm in, I'm in the, the, the server here. So it's a virtual machine? It's a, it's a virtual okay. machine. Yeah, and the, it's a virtual machine that we got from Cloudera. And, it, and, and for a dev, it's perfect. It's everything you need to do for a dev. And, and since we can create everything from scripts, which is where we're doing it, it works the same as our, as our prod and test, even though prod and test might have 500 or 1,000 nodes. So it's all good. So you can see the data goes in here. If, if we go into our file system, we could also see, and, and you guys kind of need to tell me how far you want to go, because this is a repeat of what we did. We'll see exactly the same thing that we saw before. It's got a bevo chavro file, which is, you know what it's going to look like when I, it's going to look like JSON data. It's got, it's got a, um, a schema file that should have been created. Well, it would have had to been created, otherwise it wouldn't have worked. It was auto-generated from that first row. Here's our age here, and here's our weight here. So it's got all the, the pieces that we need. Remember, we, we need, what, seven things to, to get the ETL done? It's got all those pieces done. And, and, and I, I remind everybody, you don't need to remember everything that you're seeing now because all this code is online, and, and, you can, and, and I think we'll even put the presentation online. Um, but well, no. I, I, we're get, let me okay. Let me let me get to the end, and then we'll just go on ahead and do the whole the, the whole because I think we're we think we're, we're like two slides away from the end. Let me, uh, and then we open it up all the way to questions, and we are way ahead of time, which is really good. Go drink beer early. <clears throat> so, we we went over the fact that it's the binary is 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 an OSGI version jar. We went over the fact that that we were trying to make it simple, clean, and well designed, and I hope you agree. It looks at least moderately simple. I don't, I don't know if I can say it's well designed, but it's simple and clean, and, and if you had to maintain this, it would be relatively maintainable because it's only in a few files. We, we, did, we did hope to get a, a JUnit integration tested, and did I already show you that part, the code? Okay. We showed that it was running. So, so we, have, we have an integration, a, a, a JUnit test running. This is really not a, this is a mock here, and it just shows that, that, that the camel server is working basically. But, but we, we now have a harness here that we can put any tests we want into the system here, and, and it's gonna run it for us. So that's, that's, that's not too terribly shabby. And we also have supporting scripting, which is the scripts that I showed you that we use to move files around and stuff like that. So all in all, not terribly bad. Uh, thing to have. And by the way, for each one of these these code demos, I've got a YouTube link that that show that you can. If you go and get the slide off a of slide share, you can click this link and it'll run. It'll run the demo in, in your browser. Um, 
we, we showed that we can deploy it and it's going to figure out the schema from what gets deployed. We, we showed that it, that it com, uh, compiles with Maven, runnable to draw, yeah, 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 okay, on and on. We've got the schema created, EDL run. So all these things that we tried to do, we have done. So what are our takeaways? And I'll get to your question in just a second. But what are takeaways? The takeaway is, is what have we done? Well, we've freed Brent up. Now Brent can work on what's important. He's not digging through <clears throat> blog files to figure out what he copy-pasted wrong. He's, 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 he's doing the stuff that you can't do copy-pasting. He's doing the stuff that you actually have to write a manual process for. Let me, let me give you an example here. Let's say that, that we wanted to do bring this, this file in, but then we wanted to concatenate two columns and extract a certain value from those two columns and create a third column, then you put the derivative over in a fourth column, something like that. That's an additional transform. It might be an additional two or three transforms. We want, we want to make a, a group by or, or several other processes with a very complex data set. That allows, we have now, because we haven't used any of Brent's time to do this, this uh, copy-paste work, we now have given Brent all the time that he needs to do that work and, and, and to do it well and not hurry through it because he got caught on this stuff. One bad feature is, <laughs> since nobody's yelling at Brent anymore, Brent may not be as quite as popular as he used to be. That is a bad thing for Brent. I mean, I'm, I do like the personal attention when, when my project is late. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, of course, that never really happens in real life. But, uh, but anyway, that, so so that shows us some of the takeaways. So here's where I ask you a question: If we define a home run as stuff that simply wouldn't be even possible if we hadn't if we hadn't done this with a special snow with if we had done this manually, stuff that would not even be possible. Does anything fit that description? Any? Any takers on that one? That wouldn't even be possible. Okay, well, I don't. We don't. I don't understand the question. Okay, if if we define a home run <clears throat> with all these takeaways we got, we define. Okay, this is cool, but is it a home run? Well, it's a home run if you can do something that you couldn't even do manually. Yeah, like spin up little dev environments. Yeah, so that's the first one. Spin up dev environments. <laughs> Uh, if you can't even do that manually, if if you're doing it, if you're doing it from scratch, I'm sorry, you don't have enough time. There's not, you're going to screw it up. The dev environment's going to be slightly different than the than the test, and the test is going to be slightly different than the prod. And especially since you changed the prod because you had this one feature that you just realized you had to add at the last minute, now you for sure don't have it in your dev because your dev you created before, and now it didn't have it created the same way. And the only guy that knows how to do that is the sysadmin, and he's in California. But anyway. Now we've got one way to do them all, and boom, you pop a switch and you run them all again. So that's not even possible doing the other approach. What's a second, a second thing that, that is a home run? Absolutely. Your, your manager comes to you and he says, he, says, he says, man, that is really cool. I really like the work you're doing. The Sadoop stuff is really great. But these particular three, you know, we got 15 ETL jobs here. These particular three, I talked to this Cassandra guy, this Cassandra vendor, and he really wants me to try Cassandra out on these, on these three because they're a specific type and size that would really be perfect for Cassandra. And, and if, you're, if you've done all this stuff manually, you may or may not be host. In this situation, you just write some new code templates, you take the, the part that already works, for example, the serialization to Avro, boom. Uh, rerun it, branch your code, rerun it, and boom, you now have a, a you now have a Cassandra branch for the same code, or or a, or a Couchbase branch for the same code. Now that's something that you just simply couldn't do if you're going to take this approach in a manual special snowflake kind of a world. So, number three, this this is this is a little bit more abstract, but I know you're going to identify with it. So so Mark, I come to you. I know I pick on you. This is because I know your name. So. So Mark, I come to you and, and I say, hey Mark, listen, I, I got to go do this other thing. Can you take over my project? And it's a manual project. It's a project that I did all manually from scratch, <laughs> um, including the dev VM and all that stuff. Uh, just give me a wild guess. How long is it going to take you to get everything set up and fix? And weeks, right? I mean, uh, if, if it's lucky, it's going to take weeks. And you're probably going to rewrite half of it because, frankly, you couldn't understand that part. <laughs> So, 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 
So, so the question is, and I, I, I don't know your name, the guy in the back that answered the item potent question. What was your name? Rich. Rich. So Rich, the item potent thing. So, so what you said was you can run it as many times as you want. Can I hand this project off to as many different developers as I want? Or can I stop it and then restart it again weeks later after I've forgotten all of it, it with as many times as I want? And, and have that not be a loss in productivity. And, and if you could do that, that's kind of like item potent, only it's on the effort. It's like effort item potent. So anyway, well, that's... And, I mean, it, it's, it's even more interesting than that, because if you onboard somebody new to this project, yeah. you hand them that vagrant file with the chef cookbooks, and they're up and running and ready to contribute to the team immediately. Immediately. There's no workstation set up, there's nothing. Immediately. Here Boom. you go, go go. Boom. So, so, and not only that, but we got some of the technical debt all the way out of the way. If you're doing a code manual, you know you're going to have a ton of technical debt. In this situation, we did it with, with code templates, and since we did the same one for, for 15, 300, however many ETL jobs we have, we had time to satisfy some of the technical debt. We had time to put the, 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 the test code in there. Um, so because of that, you're handing off a project perhaps without even technical debt. All of this is, makes this approach a lot more sensible than just coding this stuff by hand. So I, I think that's, that's my third home run, and so. Now I'd like to recap and we'll hit the questions. Recap, we've, 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 I hope we've shown you that the Hadoop really is pretty straightforward. It's screwy as hell. You gotta get your files and your DDL and your alter table statements and, all, and your transforms all done. But if you can manage to do that without screwing it up and without spending all your time in log files, it's not terribly hard. So, so we've, we've kind of showed that. We've, we've, we've given you some motives for automating the process and we've given you some basics in code automation which is you know, all this template-y stuff. So we kind of got that covered, and we, and we showed you an infra, uh, a demo of the, of the uh, infrastructure automation. If you, haven't, if you haven't followed any of the DevOps stuff that's going on, there's a whole community that's just full of activity right now. I'm a dev. I never pay attention to that stuff. Dude, in this town, it is going crazy with that stuff, and if you, and if you want something interesting to watch, that is an interesting place. And last but not all, at least, for everything that we've shown tonight, we'll, we've got code in the, at the end of the presentation. Um, for any future resources, I'm just going to tell you my best bet if you're going to look for future resources is Hortonworks. There's two big dogs in the Hadoop world, Hortonworks and Cloudera. Cloudera does a better job of selling work and getting paid. Hortonworks is super cool um, and seems to be better at providing good free stuff. Uh, uh, so there. Uh, I got two resources for you on the camel side of the world. The best one that I found so far is Gerald Canner. I, everything I've found out about about, Cant, uh, about camel, I found out originally from Gerald Canner at, at this very location here at this meetup, and and uh, he's he's now in Kansas City. Otherwise, he'd probably be out here haranguing me. Uh, and also, Mark is is working with Camel too, so he's a great resource. Uh, I used a lot of Camel in Action Book. The Camel mail list is very excellent. And, and I'm probably guessing, Mark, that you can probably tell me that the, the Red Hat support is probably pretty good too, right? Excellent. Okay. Yeah, they're real good. So, so uh, if you're looking for deep dives, here's a list of deep dives. Any one of these things on this list, could, you, could, you could easily lose six weeks on. Uh, there's, there's that list. If you want to see more of these kind of things, if you want to uh, invite us into your shop and, and have us do a little demo for your boss, give us a sample data, just let us know. This is the last side, so I am open for questions. So you take that that CSV file and then feed that to your camel project, and that is what then takes that and then converts it to the Avro and then spits it out to like your hive instance, and then it goes out to all the HDFS stuff. Is that, is that how that works? Or? Yeah. For, for good reason. What, what Camel is, is uh, Camel is, is called Integration Server. And, and again, this is, like, this is a six, easily a six week deep dive if you want to do it. Um, it's just a Swiss army knife of every possible thing that you could do in a distributed, you could want to do in a distributed environment. So, <clears throat> so uh, what you do is, is you tell Camel, hey, monitor this directory and watch for a file. And if you find one, then, then do this transform to it. 
or, or move it here. Um, let me try. It, it's just it's just a way to lace together commands that you would have to write. It's got kind of a using the term leaky abstraction. I had to look that up a few weeks ago. What is a leaky abstraction? How many people use that term leaky abstraction? Camel is, is pretty good on leaky abstractions. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do the wrong way with Camel, but if you have but if you have the patience to figure out how the syntax works, it it you can do just about anything with it. Okay, so I can see how Camel does the transform to Avro, and that sort of uploads it to Hive, and then Hive does the part where it actually splits it up into like how it gets on the HDFS. Yeah, what what you do, you 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 put it, you use Camel to to move it over. Let me do it on this one. You use Camel to put it over to to to, to monitor this drop folder, and then it does the transform, and then it drops. It drops the transformed file into an FTP directory here on the on the on the main Hadoop master on the Hadoop master, and then you say, "Oh, okay. Now that you got it in the FTP folder on the master, let's move that into HDFS." And the way and the way you move from from just a regular system, a regular OS into the HDFS is to use these HDFS commands. Let me see if I can find one. Right, right. It, if if you want to just kill yourself uh, with with over information, go buy a thought one of the ThoughtWorks books by Martin Fowler and a couple other guys um, on, called Enterprise Integration, Integration Patterns. Patterns, and it is like it's one of the hardest books in that series, and and it will just overwhelm you with with all the different possible permutations of, of stuff that you might need to do. But it's kind of like a Swiss Army knife. Um, and I was going to show you. Yeah, I was going to show you. Uh, what was I going to show you? How, how the thing got into the Hadoop Hive system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. Okay. So, so <laughs> I'm going to show you the script. But you, but I could have just as easily done this in the shell. Okay. This is this is what's important. This this command here, HDFS space DFS dash dash make dir, is the equivalent of the bash make dir only it's on the HDFS system. And then it says, okay, put this folder here, make this directory inside the DF, inside <laughs> HDFS. And again, if, and if we ask ourselves, what is HDFS? Right. HDFS is the simulated uh, file structure. Right. Yeah, this, in other words, this file structure doesn't really exist in a literal sense. Right. It's, it's actually placed on all over the dang place, but this is what it looks like to us, and that's what HDFS is. And I kind of lied when, when I said that, remember I said you only need to learn these few things and then you understand Hadoop. I kind of lied about the HDFS part because you sort of do need to know that it uses HDFS. That's, that's the file system for Hadoop. Have you used this in production? No, I haven't used it in production. So it's, just, it's, just something you it's, just, it's just me, but guys, Hear me when I tell you this. I'm giving you this code. I say I'm giving it. It's on GitHub, okay? You got the code. It's just a freaking Ruby uh, project. But don't take my code unless you just have to. Go write the code templates. Use Groovy. Use any, you know, a, 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 a something that takes a template and stuffs it with values from a property, from a property file. This is not heavy-duty Java. This is like first-year Java stuff. It's real, real, real easy to do. So sure, take mine if you want, but just as easily go do it yourself. It's not that hard. A camel was kind of hard for me to learn, but but the stuffing code and templates is not that hard. Or or if you're too lazy, hire us. We'll, we'll be happy to help you. But <laughs> but but that's not why I'm telling you. I don't want you to hire me. I mean, I'm, I'm not here just so you'll hire me. I, I'm just saying, do it yourself. It's easy. Just don't try to do it manually, unless you just are a glutton for punishment, <coughs> which my friends were. Do you reuse a carry for a new ETL, and what you need to do is just like do the, the serial, do something with serialization and the ETL, ETL or Yeah, I would, I would, I would just put new templates oh, in, and uh, and I would say, okay, use this new template. First of all, I'd write the code in code, make sure the code works. Then I'd take the the code and, it, and abstract the, the metadata, and, I, and then 
and then I'd convert the code with the abstracted metadata into a simple template. And then I'd tell Carrie, oh, hey, uh, when you get to this menu item, apply this template. You, you said that you have to buy, or you need to buy this, or do you buy this Cloudera VM, or do they, no, they download Oh, it's, yeah, it's free. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so they have a business of uh, providing uh, Hadoop in, in the cloud, or do they? No, no, it's support. support. Yeah, Cloudera, Cloudera is, is, is like, uh, if you're a large corporation and you have a, a Hadoop shop, and, and we just hired Hadoop, I mean Cloudera, we said, look, Here's a bunch of machines. Uh, hey, go over and install Hadoop on them, and then tell us what to do. That kind of a thing, and and they charge you know seventy five million dollars an hour, and, and <laughs> or whatever it is. It's more than I bill. I know that, uh, but it, but they they basically own that space. They are the big dogs. Hortonworks is a close second, and Pivotal is probably in a slightly different space, but uh, but. Uh, with those those other two, Pivotal is, a, is is along with VMware. So you'll need if you're trying to if if you're your boss, if you're a product project manager, you're going to be dealing with one of those big three probably. You need to do something like a group bot, where you're going to do some kind of special aggregation. You need to be able to write that in the map, for example. In other words, it's not just you can't just throw any kind of SQL code out. In other words, the kinds of things that I would write in a four fold SQL plus window, yeah. I can't get away with that on the statement. So in answer to your question, um, I don't know if I have it. I don't know if I have it, uh, but the, the Hive language file does tell you what Hive does. And and it does we did a lot of group buys in, in Hive. Now you can't do everything in in you can't do everything in Hive that you can do in SQL, but you can do a lot. That, that portion which you can't, there is also Impala and, and there's also Hawk. Impala is by Cloudera and it's met much faster than Hive. And there's Hawk and Pivotal, uh, which are additional tools that also have additional capabilities. But I think most group buys you can do inside, uh, inside Hive. Uh, you may choose also just to do additional transforms just to create new, entire new data sets just to do that. I had a thing where I was like trying to do, like everything was in there as a string, and I needed to, to go into like some section of some string, you know, or we'll use it string. You want to group by whatever this is done. Right. You want to write something custom like in a map. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to have all those goodies. Yeah, th this is this is this part here. You're referencing this part here where you got additional transforms, right. and and we just went into another six meetings just to cover those. I, I mean, it's a it's a real big topic. There's also indexing, uh, and there's also which index thing you do you want to use solar? Or do you want to use any number of indexes? So it's a real big topic uh, that that covers a lot of stuff. Mostly a joke, but looking at this slide, I see they actually. <laughs> well, it's, if you can work in that environment, yes, you can make more money. I, I can't because I go crazy. But if you can, I want our, 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 our motto is we want to automate ourselves out of a job. We want to get in and get out and make you happy.